you have your Bibles in Matthew chapter 13, um, I'm going to finish up today with them. Um, um, <clears throat> been looking at the, the parables of Matthew 13. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the parables of the soul. Jesus gave us that parable, and it's really the story of salvation. And he said that there were four souls, which represent four different types of hearts. Some are hard hearts. Now, I can't make that look any brighter than what it is. It's a hard heart. It, the Word of God cannot penetrate that heart. They've allowed things that come into their life that have so bruised and so hurt them. They're so packed down by the world that the Word cannot penetrate into it. The other is the one that uh, I call the conflicted heart. It has no depth within it. No, not fully in belief, it's shallow. So because of that, the Word of God may hit for a moment, it may spring up, but it doesn't spring up into everlasting life because when the hot sun comes, it just burns it up. And the third one is the crowded heart. That's the one who uh, the Word of God comes and they receive it quickly, but because of all the other distractions, all the other things that that are important to their heart too, it crowds in. And because it crowds in, it chokes out what the Word of God came to do. And of course, the fourth heart was the good heart. It received the Word of God. It believed the Word of God. It accepted the Word of God. And God grew it. The seed became strong and produced fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Last week... We talked about wheat and tares, the one who planted the seed, and the seed came up and was exactly what God wanted it to be, but an enemy came and planted counterfeit, denarii, tares. It looks like the real thing at the beginning, but it's not. It's false. It's fake. So the Servant said, shall we not come and, and take it up? And he said, no, 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 you can't do that. Because if you do, you'll pull up the, the good with it. The wheat, I love this part. I love this part. The wheat, it dies downward. It has no longer an attachment to the world. But as it ripens, it ripens upward. And the seed at the top will bow down. And the longer that it is there under the brightness of the sun, it will ripen. That's what we're supposed to be. Amen? The tares will be dealt with at the end of times. Now, those are the two parables that Jesus, when he gave them, he also thought it so important that he gave them the explanation along with it. But a parable was for those who had ears to hear. It is a story of truth that comes alongside a, a natural, normal thing, a picture that they can see, and they'll learn the spiritual truth by how they see it applied to that, that picture, that story that's there. So today, I, I skip two, the mustard seed and the leaven, and I want to carry the, this thought forward of the picture of salvation when we look at the parable of the treasure, of the pearl, and of the net, I pray God will add his blessings to this. If you would, if you have your Bible in Matthew 13, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? We're going to begin in verse number 44. Oh Lord, help us. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and purchases and buys the whole field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, it was extremely expensive, He went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, a net that would be drugged by boats, that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, 
And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels and threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separating the wicked from the, among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, have you understanding, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Let's pray. Father, it would have been nice to be there that day when Jesus told the story. But the understanding comes from you, from the Spirit, as you bear it into our heart. All around the world, people have read these parables, they've read these stories. And Spirit, as you have done so many times before, would you take the Word of God and not let it return void, but Lord, would you let it bring forth the light unto our hearts would it let it bring truth not only to our minds, but to our hearts? Let it find us where we are and be good medicine to our soul. Lord, may we be one with you, changed unto you, surrendered and humble before you, living our life as you so created us for your purpose and glory and will. So Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, I beg of you, bring forth the fruit today as you see fit. Give those who have ears to hear understanding that they may hear so that our lives can bring glory unto you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you be seated, please? These three have no explanation. Because of that, they've been very confused over the years. You can read about these, and I have a, a library of different people who have uh, exegeted these verses, and they've given their commentary on it. And uh, sometimes I look at those, sometimes I don't. It just depends on what the Holy Spirit's leading me to do. And I, I, I picked up one, and I, I, I read it, and it is funny how God-fearing people can look at this and come up with kind of different understandings, and they they think the treasure, you know, this is what it means, and the pearl, this is what it means, and the net, this is what it means. But and and it usually has to do with their own preconceived thoughts. They have a an understanding of their doctrine. They have an understanding of what they hope they would say, and what they hoped that they would mean. But yet, we really are looking only for what Christ wanted to unveil to us. Now, He is God, and He can in one phrase say 20 different things to 20 different types and groups and soul people. And I'm grateful for that. But really, this is a pair, three parables about salvation the first one, the treasure, really you need to understand the, the Old Testament understanding of God's people there. And then the pearl, you will see in the New Testament how Christ would come and be our Savior and God would call to Himself out of this world a church. That's us. So let's look at these and let's see exactly what it is that he would say. In each of these three, it begins by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, y'all look up here. I've been having one of those weekends. It's just been one of those clouded in my head weekends. I was uh, teaching Sunday school this morning and, and I was kidding with them. I always, I like my whiteboard and my markers. And, and y'all know I can do numbers, right? Math is easy. All that science, and I, can, I can handle that. But spelling, 
I can butcher spelling like you've never. Now, some of you may be saying, oh, you can't spell? Not really. Uh, Lance was in Sunday school when he was teaching one day, and he wrote a word up there, and we all knew he misspelled it. So you know what he did? He put a squiggly line underneath it. Like when you're typing on your computer and you misspell it and it all gets underlined in red. I've been having one of those weekends where I can still add. As far as I know, two plus two is four. I got that part down. But my mind is kind of hard to comprehend. I've been having a, a, a tough week with my, with my, my spelling and I, I think my brain goes so quickly. But really it's my brain's just can only understand certain things maybe there's such greater things that he didn't want me to have to understand spelling but to think of the things of God of heaven the glory joy peace love love not like the world gives but the love of God the love that will forgive The love that not only will forgive, but will pray blessings on the one that wounded us. When God says the kingdom of heaven is like, He understands that our finite minds does not have the capacity to understand the infinite. The vastness. I can understand colors to a degree. Y'all know about red? Amen? Y'all know about blue? Y'all got yellow. But sometimes they start to add and put a little bit of this and a whole lot of that, and it comes up with something, and they don't call it red and yellow. My wife will never say something's red. She'll have a different name for it. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? My mother-in-law at our wedding wore a dress, and I said, that's a nice little pink dress. She says, that's Dusty Rose. (laughs) There's variations of those things that, you know, when Crayola gave us the box that had all those different names on it, I just picked out the one I liked. I didn't worry about what it was. There's so much to the vastness of God that is beyond our understanding of how God moves all of those things together. So he tries to simplify it by telling a story, and then the powerful Holy Spirit will come and make it come alive in our life. So when we see this treasure hidden in a field, he's talking about his people, his special people. His God-called people. Today, you would know them as Jews. They were given to Abraham, Israel to the world. If you have your Bible, look in uh, in Genesis chapter number 12. If you don't, just look up there and Caleb will have it on the screen for you. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Listen to verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, church, nowhere in here does this statement of God ever go out of truth. It is alive. It is real. So the same thing that he said to Abraham in that day when he said, I will make you a nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. Those things are still true today. The Jews are still God's chosen (coughs) people. 
He loves them with an everlasting love. And when it says that he will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them, he means it today. So there's a lot of this stuff that's going on in the world today that this scripture says, you better side with my people. And if we side with him, he will, the, them, they will, he will bless us. Now you may look at it and say, uh, it hadn't always been that way. Yes, it has. But when God brought these people, he used them to be a witness to the world but they didn't always follow God. But his promise to them was still there. And because they didn't follow God and they were not a, a good witness to them, he allowed them to be hidden in this world. And they have been scattered so many times. And in 1948, matter of fact, May 14th, 10 days from now, in 1948, they were brought back together as a nation. Yes, I think we're getting closer to what people call end times. And God's going to fulfill something in them. But it's still not yet the day of them. They have the opportunity to find salvation. But they're going to have to do it through all, like all the rest. Today, salvation comes to the Jew and to the Gentile. He is, they are, to him, a treasure. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. Are y'all okay with the Word of God? He doesn't hiccup. He says it straight out flat. He means what he says. He says, he says, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You shall be if you obey and you follow me. They just didn't. In um, Psalms 100 and um, where is it? Where is it, Kale? Psalms 100 and did I write it down for you? No, sir. We didn't, we didn't need to read that one anyway. <laughs> Y'all good with how God works? I told you it's been one of them weekends for me. <clears throat> this is Psalms 135, verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. Praise God that Israel may have failed God, but God never failed Israel. He has a people for himself. So he says that now, though they are a treasure, they are hidden in a field. But this is what he says, which when he saw in this world, he, he allowed them to be hid, but he said, for the joy over it, he goes Come on now. The God of eternity, the God of all of heaven, the God that there is no term that we have that can describe the wealth of the Almighty. He says, I'll let it all go for you. Look in Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like, but this time it's like a, a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. This is the church. This is you and I. <clears throat> the church are the people that are called out from the world. There's the Jews, there's the Gentiles, but then there's the saved that are called out from them, and they are the church. When you repent of your sins, and you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
when he writes your names down in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are baptized in to the church. It is believers. It is the fulfillment of God's plan from, from before the foundation of the world. A pearl. It is formed in an oyster. It lives in the sea. And something happens inside the oyster. Something will come in, maybe a grain of sand, and will wound the oyster. And there is something that comes around that wound that the oyster brings. And over time, now it's a quick process. It happens within three to five years. Around that wound, a pearl will be formed. Now, if it were not for the wound, there would not be a pearl. But the only way that you get the pearl is the oyster has to die. And the pearl will be taken out. Now, a pearl is not like a diamond, an emerald, any of the precious stones. They can be, they can be chiseled on. They can be cut. When you men bought that diamond for your wife, you got a particular cut, whether it's an oval or whether it's pear-shaped or whatever it may be. There's big ones, there's small diamonds, there's all those things. Oyster can't be that way. Now, there can be fake pearls, cultured pearls. They can be... Uh, done in the world, but they're fake. They're not the real deal. The, but you can take a pearl and crush it. It's formed in a wound, and it lives vicariously, beautiful, but it can be crushed. The church was formed in a wound, the wound of Calvary where Jesus gave everything. When he saw the church, he gave up all the treasures of heaven. Christ was wounded for our iniquities, for the chastisement of our sins. And we became his, and he became ours. He treasured us to sell all that He had for us. Then there's the third, verse 47. The kingdom of heaven is like a drag net. A boat would take this net and dip it down into the water and start to sail. And it would sail in different places in different ways. It would it would sail with the current. It would sail against the current. It would come this way. It would come that way. It would go into deep waters. It would come into shallow waters. And it really didn't care. It was just gathering everything that the net could bring in. And they would come up to the shore, and they would get out and drag that net up to the shore. Look what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and it gathered some of every kind. Can I just pause here? Let me tell you one of the things that grieves my soul today. Y'all ever heard this phrase, the birds of a feather flock together? That means people that are like-minded will huddle up together. That's not what the church is supposed to be. People move to where they're comfortable. Jesus moves towards those that he loves. And in the world today, he loves all kinds. Some that the world would call beautiful, some that the world would call ugly. Some that the world would say doesn't, hasn't been given much. Some that were born the children of a king. Some that have an easy path, some that have a hard path. 
Some that are of one race. Some that are of a different race. But God loves us all. When we get to heaven, there will not be different sections. There won't be a section for this group to flock together and there won't be a section over here where this group flocks together. If, that, if we have that mentality on earth, that's us, that's not God. Heaven will be for anyone saved by grace. Through faith, not of ourself, lest anyone should boast. Matter of fact, I heard a preacher say one time, when you get to heaven, you're going to see some people that you're surprised that they're there. And you're going, to see, you're going to be looking for some others that you just knew were there, but their absence will be there. He, he cast the net in and he, he, he gathered some of every kind. Which when it was full, he drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels. Oh, there's a good one. There's a good one. Exciting. Y'all, how many of y'all like fishing? How many of y'all have ever hooked one? Amen? And, and, and nobody says, golly, I caught another. <laughs> oh, no. I got to reel it in. You know, Eeyore the fisherman. Oh, no. No, when you catch one, what happens? Hey! I love interactive crowd. <clears throat> How many of you have caught a tree? A stump? I have my granddaughter Thursday afternoon. I got to pick her up from school. And we went to this holy place that's called Bass Pro Shop. And, and we went in, and she says, Daddy, there's a moose. Or Grant Pops, she called me Pops. Pops, there's a moose. I said, it sure is. It's big, isn't it? Yeah. So we looked at the different things around. I said, you want to see the fish? She said, real fish? <laughs> well, yeah. All the rest were stuffed. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They didn't have a live buffalo in there. They, uh, they... So we went back to the, have y'all ever been to the Holy Place Bass Pro Shop? And they got the place back there and the water's coming in it, you know, and their fish. They had to hunt to get some of those fish. There was a nose on one of those fish that was that long. I think I, I dated its sister or something. I don't know. <laughs> all those different fish that looked different. But they were all doing the same thing. Come on. They were all surrounded by the water. I don't think they looked at the others and said, you're ugly. They just looked at each other and said, get out of my way, I'm coming through, right? But there is coming a day when God will say, you are beautiful to me. Come home, my child. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. But to the other, the most loving God would say, I do not love you. You rejected my love. I withhold my love for you. I withhold my presence from you. I withhold my joy and my peace from you. Depart from me. I never knew you. So it will be, verse 49. At the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. Anyone who wants to tell you there's not a hell does not look at Scripture. They'll take one verse somewhere and they'll twist it, and they'll take it out of context, and they'll, context, and they'll try to say, this is not, there is no hell, there is no lake of fire. Jesus talked more about hell than He did heaven. Here he says plainly, the angels will separate them. To some, when we die, we take our last breath here. To, to me, I will be 
I don't know how it's, I've never died before, so I don't really know how it's going to go, but, but I'm going to be ushered into his presence by the angels. To others, they will be ushered into the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels called hell. I don't know if it literally is a furnace of fire or maybe he was just using something that is one of the most painful things just to say that is something you do not want to go to. Is it literally? <clears throat> Preachers have said yes. Preachers have said, I'm just once again, I got that finite mind. How can God describe the infinite? All I know is I don't want to go there. <clears throat> This is a parable. This is a section of parables that says the Word of God is there for you if you would receive it. But Satan's always going to have counterfeits. Satan's always going to have people who would rather have their way than God's way. Though we are a treasure, though we are the church, the pearl that, that he was wounded for, we have formed something out of that that is precious to him. And he was willing to give up all of heaven for it. But my soul grieves those that will be cast aside. Because God loved them with an everlasting love too, they just chose not to receive it. He's trying to to get them to understand that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Don't follow your way, follow his way. It may be a narrow path, but it's worth it. Mark was talking about holiness. That means separation. That means we need to separate from this world. When we talk about the wheat, it dies to this world, and it rises and bows before him. And he will ripen us into something that's beautiful and sweet for him. But in this world, though we're so surrounded by all of the, the ugliness and the evil that's there, we must allow ourselves to choose that which is holy unto Him. Yes, we're told that in the end times, many people who have a love for God will grow cold. May it never be said of us. There will be weeping, there will be wailing, there will be gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus looked at his crowd and said, Have you understood all these things? <clears throat> they said to him, Yes, Lord. How many of y'all understand everything I just shared? How many of you by faith are ready to receive it though? I think they didn't understand all the nuances of it, but they got the gist. And by faith, they were willing to receive it. It hurts me. I grieve over the lost condition of our world and of the unconcern of his church. No, I grieve over my soul. I grieve over the unconcern in my soul. I grieve over taking his word so lightly. I grieve over not living by faith more. I grieve over caring more what happens to me than what God wants to have happen. I grieve over my concern rather than his concern. I grieve over people leaving this earth without Jesus. I grieve over their weeping and gnashing of teeth. You may say, but preacher, when we go to heaven, all that will be taken away from us and we'll only know the joy of the Lord. 
Church, on the night before the cross, my Lord was in such distress that blood came from His brow because of the stress that He was under. Maybe we need to weep a little bit more for those that aren't there. I don't know who's listening. I don't know who's the real and who's the counterfeit. That's not my job. I'm not supposed to judge. I'm just supposed to love. But if you don't know, if you don't know that you know that you know that you know that you know, if you don't have the peace of God in your heart, if you don't know that if you died today that you go to heaven, you need to get it right today. And if you have loved ones, and I know that you do, that are not living for Christ, are you grieving their soul? If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, we're going to call it a duck. But there's so many people today that talk like Christ in the church but look like the world. May the Holy Spirit do what only He can do and add the blessing to our hearts.